All right, well, good, good afternoon to you and everybody in Facebook world. I'm trying to figure out how to get everything in line. All right, so. Fantastic. So today we're talking about handling buyer concerns with inspections. And uh, so we have a slideshow prepared for us. So we want to start out with what's the purpose of an inspection? And with only one person in the room, uh, you get to make the first guess. Okay, um, basically we get to kind of see what problems there are in maybe the house that aren't listed. Kind of. Kinda, and that's the reason I asked this question and want to pose it. So the purpose of the inspection, when you look at the contract and the way our sales process is set up, is the intention of the inspection is for the buyer to discover whatever they need to discover to be comfortable moving forward, okay? So, so often when we talk about inspections, people are just thinking about the home inspector that they hire to go out and inspect the property. But when we talk about our due diligence period, we need to inspect everything. So that's our chance to review the documents, the seller's property disclosure, the community association disclosure. It's our chance to get copies of the community covenants and instructions, the community covenants and restrictions, to find out what are the rules for living in the community. And it's our opportunity to do any inspections that we need to do, okay? The hiring a home inspector like in an Ameristag or in MPI or Win Home Improvements, that's just one type of inspection, okay? We may, may need more than that. So what are some potential, I know I'm putting you on the spot because you've been an agent for all of three days? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so no, no, no. what are some other things that a home inspector wouldn't inspect that we might need to have inspected? Termites, that's exactly right. A home inspector is not a licensed pest control company. Now they're going to look for termites, but that's not their job. They're not stamping and saying, yes, I'm a termite inspector. Can you think of anything else that they don't inspect at all? No, and that's okay. I know, I'm putting you on the spot. So your home inspector is not gonna inspect a pool or pool equipment, okay? They're not going to inspect a well, okay? They're not going to inspect a boat dock, okay? There's things that are outside the scope of what they do, and so we may need to get somebody else in. But the, the purpose of an inspection is not to find everything that's wrong with the property so that we know what to ask the seller to fix, okay? It's for us to find out what are all the things we need to know about the property, know whether we're willing to move forward or not, okay? If there are things that would keep us from moving forward that we discover during this time period, then we can either ask for it to be corrected or some other concession. And, and, and we'll get to that as we move our way through it. So what's the process of, of having a home inspection done and a home inspector? Well, typically once we're under contract, we wanna get that property inspected as soon as possible. And I'm trying to look at you and Facebook at the same time. So um, we want to get an inspector as soon as possible. Now, who's that inspector going to be? Okay. Well, there are some people that will inspect the home themselves. Okay. They, they have the experience and the history. They feel comfortable that, that they know enough to inspect the home for themselves. For your average consumer, do they know enough to inspect the property? No. Not at all. Um, they may have a friend or a family member that they want to inspect the property. Is that okay? Yeah, they can have anybody they want to inspect it, okay? Be a friend, a family member, a contractor, anyone that they trust, they, they can do whatever inspections they want uh, to, to uncover what they need to know to be comfortable moving forward. But usually it's gonna be an inspection company. Um, and if they hire an inspection company, who gets to pick the inspector? The buyer gets to pick whatever inspector they want to, okay? And do most people have a relationship with an inspector? No, most of them don't know. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna ask you, you know, who do you recommend? So 
have a relationship with two or three that you know well, you, you like the reports that they put together, and, and here's the big thing, is there are uh, different ways that an inspector will present information, okay? Uh, some of them will be uh, very clinical, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, okay? And, and that can strike a lot of fear in a buyer's heart. We don't want inspectors that are gonna blow our deals away, okay? And make mountains out of molehills. You want somebody that has a very realistic approach. Hey, this doesn't meet code today, but it met code when it was built, and as long as it's functioning properly, shouldn't be a big issue. But it's something to keep an eye on. Okay, that's a much better perspective on it. So you want people that think like that. Uh, so they're they're going to you're going to be having a conversation. Let's get our inspector out there. You already have somebody in mind that you want to use for your inspection company. You know, let me introduce you to a couple of them. Do you have a preference? Uh, would you like me to call and set the inspection up, or do you want to call and set the inspection up? And, and there's no right or wrong answer there. That, that's in their control. Some of them will want to shop prices around a couple of them, but uh, you know, just make sure that they know that like with so many things, uh, you get what you pay for, okay? And you want an inspector that's gonna be very thorough, that's gonna provide you a very thorough report and some pictures. But again, it's their purchase, it's their decision to make. May not be our preference, but we're gonna live with that, okay? Uh, they're then going to probably go to us and we will have to go through the listing agent to get that inspection scheduled, okay? And then the inspector's gonna show up on that day. Now, professional inspectors, they will have an ET. My phone's on the stand. Um, they'll have an ET, just like we do, to be able to get in the property, but they will need what's called a CES code, okay? So if it's your listing, or your inspector may be asking you to call the listing agent and get the CES code, this stands for call before showing, okay? So if you ever hear a call before showing code, that's what they're talking about. Um, every super lock box has a CES code. So a appraiser that goes out there, they have to not only know their code, they also have to know the CES code to release it. Whereas as a real estate agent, we just need to know our code. Okay, so they need both. So we'll get them their code, we'll make the arrangements for them to have access. A good inspector is typically going to spend two to three hours at the property doing the inspection. Okay, do you need to be there for two to three hours while they're doing the inspection? No. Does the buyer need to be there for two to three hours while they're doing the inspection? No. Can they be? Yes. And you may have the occasional buyer that wants to be. I would encourage you to discourage them from being there. Let the inspector do their job. Okay. Um, they know what to do. They're going to be up and down ladders. They're going to be down in crawl spaces. They're going to be in the attics. Um, they don't need you asking questions every five minutes about what are they doing? What are they looking at? Is there any problem up there? What they will do, and the good companies are so happy to do it, is they are glad for the buyer to show up and meet them for the last 30 minutes of the inspection where they have a chance to recap everything that they saw that they felt like was an issue and walk you through the property and show you exactly where it is, how big of a deal is it, um, but it's a chance for them to report their findings in person, not just on paper. That's a great time for your client to show up. And if your client can't be there, it's a great time for you to show up. You both don't have to be there, and I'm not gonna tell you it's good or bad, uh, if, if you want to be there for everyone or if you're just sending your buyer that that's part of your value proposition is you've got to figure out what works for you and for your business but for your buyer's peace of mind it's great for them to show up in those last 30 minutes and it's an inspector you know and trust that isn't going to blow up the deal they will actually smooth over a lot of the issues okay their their job is to find everything that's wrong with the property. So they're gonna go through and they're gonna test every outlet, they're gonna look in every nook and cranny, and they're gonna put all this stuff on a report, and that can be really intimidating to a, uh, to a buyer, 
Uh, but when they tell them in person, it needs to be on the report, but when they tell them in person, hey, this is gonna be on the report, but this isn't anything I would worry about, goes a long way toward keeping emotions in check. Okay, making sense so far? Yeah. All right, so then at some point, we're gonna get a copy of the inspection report, okay? Typically it's gonna take one to two days later, and this is for your normal home inspection. If we're testing for radon, um, if we're testing for mold, they, they set up a station, it stays there for a day, and then they have to come back and get it. Some of them have to send it to the lab. It could take two to three days to get those types of tests back, okay? Uh, but once we have everything back in our hands, that, that's when we're gonna move on and figure out how we get it. So let's talk for a second about what the scope of what a home inspector does is, okay? And when you, when you look through a home inspection report, this is gonna become really obvious. The, the, you look at anything in a property, there's really four different scenarios as far as the, uh, the inspector is concerned, okay? Um, the first one, there's no issue, okay? They're gonna look at different things and they're gonna say, I don't find a problem here. They're gonna look at some things and they're gonna say, this is definitely a problem. Okay? That's pretty simple, right? Okay, where it starts getting a little complicated is they say it's a potential issue, okay? Uh, we noticed some cracks in the foundation. Uh, you should probably have this inspected by a structural engineer and, and get more information, you know? The water pressure's low, recommend further evaluation by a licensed plumbing contractor. Uh, there appears to be some wear on the roof, recommend further inspection by a licensed roofing company. So they're not experts at any part of the house, but when they see something that that just doesn't look quite right, they're gonna tell you, you need to go get more information, okay? And then the last one is beyond the scope. We don't do wells, we don't do pools, we don't do, we don't do, we don't do. For example, for air conditioning units, okay? Only HVAC contractors are licensed to actually open up an AC unit and look on the inside. So a home inspector that goes out, they're just making a visual inspection of the exterior of the thing. So in the report, it will say, uh, we noticed this, we noticed this, anything else is beyond the scope of what we can do. Recommend further evaluation by a licensed HVAC contractor. Okay, so you're gonna see it over and over again. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at a few reports so you have a better idea of what those reports look like. So, and I've got three that are pulled up and you're gonna see Here's one from Sure Thing Inspections. Here's one from Amerispec. Here's one from NPI. What's the first thing that you notice? They kind of all look the same, right? Okay. It, it's really the quality of the people that you're talking to uh, that makes a big difference. So as, as we go through and we start looking at some of the details that are inside these, one of the things that they will all have in common, uh, most all will have in common, is they will have a summary, okay? So here are all the big issues that we found, uh, but you'll also see all the different things that they inspect in the house. Um, they will give you definition, general terms, and do you, do you see my page count right here? 92 pages, okay? Let, let's look at this one from Sure Thing Inspections, where it's 42 pages. This one over here, 50 pages. 50 to 100 pages is not an unusual occurrence, even if there are minimal issues with the property. Because they're gonna say, we looked at this and it looks fine. So you'll see a ton of that. So let, let's take a look at a couple of these examples though. So uh, we're looking at the exterior, here's the style of the house, and then they're gonna start going through. And here's a great example. There's a crack in the sidewall. Is that a surprise? No, and I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody that there's a crack in the sidewall. 
uh, as far as I know, there's two types of concrete. There's concrete that's cracked, and there's concrete that's gonna crack, okay? That's it, okay? But it is an issue with the property, and they do have to call it out. And because it is a property, it says, we recommend further evaluation by licensed contractor for repairs or replacement. You're gonna see that phrase over and over again, even on what we might think are minimal issues. Now we start getting into foundation and we start getting into cracking here. Well, the types of cracking there are um, can indicate different things, okay? They're not a structural engineer. They're not a foundation specialist. So when they see something like this, they're gonna tell you a licensed structural engineer will need further review and recommend necessary repairs, okay? So the, the thing, and I'll address this again in just a second, when it recommends that we need further inspection, whose job is it to do that further inspection? It's on the buyer, okay? So I want you to use the analogy for a second. Can you imagine going to buy a car from somebody? and saying, okay, I really like your car, I'd like to buy your car, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take it over to my mechanic and have them inspect it and bring me back the report from what my mechanic said. Does that seem like a, no. What, what, what do they teach you to do? If you're gonna go buy a car and you're not buying a dealership, you take it to your mechanic, you get it inspected, and then you make the decision whether you want to buy it or not. Georgia's a buyer beware state, okay? The, the, the seller's under no obligation. And imagine for a second, because let's take it to the extreme, and I were to show up at your house, and I were to say, I want to buy your house. Uh, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go get a roofing contractor to inspect your roof and let me know what's wrong with it. I want you to get an electrician to inspect the electrical system and tell me what's wrong with it. I want you to get a plumber to inspect the plumbing system and tell me what's wrong with it. I want you to get a structural engineer to inspect the foundation and tell me what's wrong with it. I want you to get a concrete specialist to inspect the, uh, the settlement in the driveway and tell me uh, what it's gonna cost to get the driveway restored. I want you to get an arborist out here and verify for me that all the trees are in good healthy condition and not at any risk of falling on the house. How likely am I to win that contract? No. no. Inspections are the responsibility of the buyer. So uh, it's really important to understand that. And, and a lot of new agents don't understand that. And so you will get amendments to address concerns that are asking them to have an HVAC contractor come out, have a licensed pest control operator come out to do an inspection and confirm that there's nothing wrong with it. No, it's your job to have the inspection done. And then if there's a problem found, ask to have corrective action taken, okay? And we'll talk about that more. So, but they look at, you know, the doors and they see there's a crack in the frame of the door, okay? Uh, they tell you that it has to be repaired? No, they tell you they suggest you review it for repair or replacement by a licensed contractor, okay? Do you think that they ever tell you to, uh, it would recommend that it be repaired by the seller? No. Would it recommend it be repaired by the buyer? No. Recommended to be repaired by a handyman? No. It's always gonna be by a licensed contractor. Does it take a licensed contractor to install a ceiling fan? No. To re-nail the gutters to the house? No, okay? So you gotta understand though, their job is to find everything that's wrong and tell you what's the ideal way for you to fix it. Go hire a professional, okay? Not everything requires a professional uh, to fix. Some things can be done by the seller, some cannot. But you'll see with, uh, like with Ameristec, we've got really good pictures. We've got good pictures of the roof showing that there's missing shingles and things there. And we'll see that we've got a lot of those pictures, but guess what it says at the bottom of the roof? I'm gonna get it at the top. I bet you it says, uh, 
Terrific materials show extensive wear and tear, contributing to an energy use less. Recommend further evaluation by a licensed roofer prior to close. Okay, so they're always just going to recommend further evaluation, and and that's and that's what we want to do. Uh, when you get to the end of their report, is when they have their summary. Zoom so you'll see a lot of red in there. Yeah. Here is their summary report. So here were the most important things that we saw. So we're on page 89 of 92. So we've got a four page summary wrapping up what the first 88 pages are. But you get a 92 page report. What's your initial reaction? You know, holy cow. Yeah, same thing. Let, let's look at the other two. I think one of these put their summary at the beginning. Yeah, there's their summary at the beginning. And you'll see, I'm not a fan of their report because their recommendations are the same color as the text. I like, at least with their stuff, how they change the color to red. Here's what you need to do, okay? But they've got good pictures, good size. They take several pictures in here, so I don't have any issues with that. Uh, they're measuring the temperature differential. So as you look at these different reports, you, you see they're all very similar to each other. So we've got our definitions, here's our scope, then we have our summary. And uh, MPI over here tells you, eh, this is so-so, we definitely recommend repair, definitely recommend repair. So they've got a different way of presenting the, the same information. So there is no standard way for these to be done. So that's the big takeaway I want you to have. So we've gotten our inspection done, and now we've got our recourse. So we've now got an inspection in our hand, it got sent back to our buyer, what are our options? What do we do now that we have the inspection? Well, we've got four different options, okay? The first one being, we terminate the contract, okay? The, the house has serious foundation issues. Boom, done, I, I, I don't want it. I, I know we can't do anything with it, okay? Uh, I, I don't even want it fixed, I just wanna walk away. Uh, for some buyers, there's gonna be too many problems that I, I, I don't think I want a house that has this many issues with it. Even if we got the big ones fixed, I'm not comfortable moving forward. But typically speaking, are we buying new homes? No, we expect there to be problems. Every home is going to have some problems. It doesn't matter how big are the problems. And, and some problems are big enough that, yeah, we, we want them terminated. Okay? We have the option to proceed as is. Just because the inspection report says there's a couple of things that are wrong on there, is it, is it reasonable that uh, we might be okay with the problems that are there? Yeah. Especially if we got the house at a good price, we may not feel like we need anything else. Um, and, and there are some properties out there where the only issues are cosmetic issues. Okay, so the paint's a little runny. I don't expect the seller to repaint the house. The further, next one is further inspection. Okay, so you get a report and it says that, like the one we just looked at, and we saw all the pictures with the roof. Before I take any other step, I want to get a roofing contractor out and get them to look at that roof and tell me, okay, it looks like there may be problems. The home inspector said there may be problems. You're the professional. Are there problems? And what would it take to fix it? Okay, does the whole roof need to be replaced? Do we just need to uh, drop a few extra shingles in? Is it partly replaced, partly not? Um, but, but get further inspection done. And then lastly, negotiate repairs and terms. Okay. And and there's no uh, there's no one answer on this. Okay, um, everything kind of comes into play at this point. So give you a good example. Uh, had a client that the went and had the inspection done. The roof was in terrible shape. So we had a licensed contractor go out there, and they were like, "Yep, there's no salvaging the roof. It's reached the end of its life." 
beyond repair, the only recourse is it's going to have to be replaced. Okay? Well, do we ask the seller to replace it? Do we buy it as is and we replace it? Um, do we negotiate a lower price and we replace it? Well, for my buyer, they didn't have the money to replace it at the first. So even if they got it at a lower price, it wasn't going to work for them to buy the house and then have to turn around and pay $14,000 to have a roof replaced. Okay? Um, and, and the seller was willing to give us a concession for the roof. But what we were able to negotiate is we raised the sales price of the house by $7,000 and they did the repair before we moved in. Okay? So while the roof cost $14,000, we paid $7,000 more for the house and that repair went into our mortgage, okay? So they didn't have to come out of pocket for the money, okay? But we got the repair done ahead of time, okay? Um, so this could be just a reduction in sales price. This could be an increase in seller's contribution to closing. And, and that's one place that you have to be careful. So let's say that we're working with a client and they're buying a house and we're under contract for $260,000, okay? And there's $5,000 worth of repairs that we're wanting to be done. Well, the seller has already agreed to pay uh, $4,500 of our closing costs, okay? And I know you're green green, so this is, anyway. Uh, there, there's $5,000 worth of repairs to make. Well, our closing costs are only going to be $7,600, okay? That's what our actual closing costs. And, and how do I know what my closing costs should be? I talk to the lender, okay? Well, if I ask for an increase in seller's contributions to closing, and I say, well, give me $9,500 in seller's contributions to closing, that's an up-to number. Okay, on the contract. So when we fill in seller's contribution closing, we're paying up to $9,500. Well, how much were the actual closing costs? $7,600. So how much is the seller going to have to pay? $7,600. They get to keep the other $1,900 in their pocket, and my client didn't benefit at all. Now we got. Uh, uh, we did get $3,100 more than we would have because we got to keep that money in our pocket, but I wanted $5,000. So what I may have to do instead of asking for $5,000 in seller contribution to closing, ask for the $7,600 and maybe we reduce the sales price by $2,000. That's not going to give me all the $5,000 in my pocket. Or we say, well, will you fix these $2,000 worth of stuff and give us $7,500 in seller's contributions to closing? And that way, some of it got done by them, some of it we'll do after closing with the money we got to keep. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yeah. So, so, having never done a contract before, yeah. <laughs> I know it can be a, a little bit intimidating. So, um, so it can be anything in between. When, once we start this negotiation period though, everything's on the table. We can change the price, we can change the closing date, we can change the seller's contributions to closing. Um, everything is up and, and on the table, okay? So the way that we, uh, we're gonna get to the form for just a second. So let, let's talk about setting the right expectations with our clients, because we've really kind of covered a, a whole bunch in this already. Uh, but you get through this time. So we want the buyer knowing that what's reasonable, what's not reasonable. What's the process? Let's, let's, because one of the most uncomfortable places for someone to be is not knowing what's gonna happen next, right? Nobody likes not knowing what's coming. So, Having already seen kind of how complicated a inspection report is, how intimidating they can be, when do you think is the right time to let them know what to expect in an inspection report? Probably before 
before the inspection. Absolutely before the inspection. <laughs> but when would be the ideal time? I would say all the way back when you first met with them. Okay. That needs to be part of that initial buyer conversation. Okay. We need to have conversations of, of them understanding here's what the process is going to look like. Okay. Moving from today to going and looking for the property, finding a property, putting offers in on the property, uh, having the inspection, getting the appraisal, getting ready for closing up. I'm gonna walk them through that whole process so they know what to expect. And, and some of the things that I want them to know about the inspection is, is number one, they're gonna to need to pay for it, okay? For a lot of buyers, they have no idea that they need to budget and plan for it. They, they talked to a lender and the lender said they need three and a half percent down. Well, they didn't talk to them about what closing costs they're gonna need. And they didn't talk to them about the fact that they're gonna to have to pay for an inspection. And they haven't talked to them about the fact that they're gonna to have to pay for an appraisal. All they planned for was three and a half percent down, okay? And as soon as you tell them, okay, well, it's time to order the inspection, it's gonna be $450. If they weren't expecting it, how's that gonna feel? Somebody should have told them, okay? So we wanna have that conversation at the beginning. And then two, setting the right expectations around the inspection itself. We're not doing the inspection to find out what are all the repairs that need to be done by the seller for us to buy it. It's an inspection we're doing to find out is there anything we don't know about the property that would keep us from buying it. It, it sounds like a subtle difference, but an application, it, it's black and white, night and day, okay? So also preparing them that the inspector is going to look for every little thing that's wrong with the property and not to be surprised if we get an 80 or 90 page report but what we'll do is when we get that report is we'll go through it in detail and we'll be looking for any hidden issues that we didn't know about okay that, that we feel like we needed to know about and, and the things that are most important in that inspection report are things that are either a threat to the house or a threat to safety, okay? And any of those issues are the ones that take precedence, okay? And preparing them for the fact that we're probably not, or potentially not gonna get all of our questions answered in the inspection report. We may need to have some follow-up inspections done before we have enough information to figure out what the right solution is. Making sense? Mm -hmm. right. so, today's market um, also has a big influence on uh, setting those right expectations. What kind of a market are we in right now? A buyer or a seller's market? Uh, a seller's market. A seller's market, okay. So do you think that sellers need to do as much as they've done in the past in order to sell their home? And so if a buyer comes back with, hey, uh, we're under contract, we just had our inspection report back, here's these 42 items we want you to fix before we buy your house, okay? What, what's the seller gonna tell you? No, okay? Because they've got a list of the other people that they had 14 offers on your property, they had 25 offers on the property. If you don't wanna buy it, fine. I've got 25 other people that do. Okay, but there are some things that are in the inspection report that are gonna be issues for any buyer, okay? Those are the issues we need to address, okay? The ones that, yeah, there's gonna be plenty of people that are gonna let that go, okay? Uh, little stuff, $100, $200 repair, let's not go to battle over that, okay? The AC system doesn't work, yeah, that's a big deal. That, that's an expectation that that's gonna work, okay? The, the dishwasher leaks, yeah, that's reasonable. We do expect the dishwasher to work, okay? But, you know, the, the kitchen doesn't have a GFCI outlet in it, okay? A GFCI is $20, you can go buy it at Home Depot, you can install it yourself. I, I'm not gonna not buy a $400,000 house 
because it doesn't have a GSEI on it. Okay? Even if I want to go hire a, uh, a, a, an electrician to put it in for me, um, that's going to be $100, $25 mm -hmm. for the visit. And since they're already there, I can have them check other things, you know, because that'll be part of their service call. Um, I'm not going to let that keep me from buying a $400,000 house. Okay? The roof is shot, the AC system's on, the, the uh, water heater, you know, is rusted and, and about to blow up. Um, those are things, yeah, make that part of the deal. Make that. But, but don't quibble over little stuff, don't give long lists. And certainly, you shouldn't be asking for anything on the on the amendment to this concern that you already knew was a problem before the inspection. Okay, if I show up to a house and I'm putting an offer in on a house, the expectation is I'm putting an offer on a house as is. I'm not expecting there to be repairs. So if there was a broken window, I'm I'm not expecting them to fix the window. I made my offer knowing that the window was broken. Okay. Now, if it's important that that window be fixed, put that in your initial offer. Not come back later and say, hey, now that we've agreed, I want to change this and this and this. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, writing the amendment, and this is where things get really tricky. Because um, so many agents do this really poorly. So the amendment that we use after an inspection to address concerns, change the price, uh, change the seller's contribution program is called an amendment to address concerns. And, and it's in, in principle a very simple form, but the use and the application of it can be a little bit tricky. So it starts out with our amendment date, our amendment letter, our date, uh, the buyer and the seller's name, the binding agreement date, and the address of the property, okay? That's just simple, simple informational stuff. We come down here and it says, in consideration of seller agreeing to address certain concerns, which is gonna be the stuff down here, okay? All parties agree that if this amendment is signed by buyer and seller and delivered to both parties, the remainder of buyer's due diligence period shall or shall not terminate, okay? The, the, the big thing about that language is, um, I, I imagine two scenarios. So Savannah, um, I, we're under contract for your house and we've had our inspection done. And I come to you as a buyer and I say, hey Savannah, uh, I want you to do these three things. And, and if you'll do this, um, well, we're headed to the closing table. I'm not gonna ask for anything else from it. Don't, my mind's made up, if you'll agree to that, we're two thumbs up, okay? Or that's shall terminate, okay? You agree to this, closing table, here we come, okay? Shall not terminate, which is what so many agents mark, is me saying, hey Savannah, uh, now that we're under contract, we've got our inspection done, I really want you to do these three things and want you to go ahead and agree to do it, but, there's a chance that in the next couple of days, I may come back and ask you to do some more stuff. And I might change my mind and not even buy your house. But I want you to go ahead and agree to these three things. Okay? Which one of those is going to be better received by you as a seller? The first one. Now, it's, it's kind of common sense when it's put that way, but the contract doesn't put it that way. So, shall terminate is always going to be the better option. The only time that I use shall not terminate is if I'm trying to save my clients money on future inspections. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, I'm trying to buy your house, Savannah, and the, the roof is shot. It's gonna have to be replaced, okay? Um, but you also have a swimming pool, and you have a well, and there may be some uh, foundation issues, okay? I'm expecting the pool's gonna be fine, I'm expecting the well's gonna be fine, and, and I think that the foundation's gonna be fine, but I haven't got my inspectors out there, okay? And before I pay for a structural engineer, a pool contractor, and a well company to come out 
and, and test the water. I want to know, can we get the roof replaced? Because if we can't get the roof replaced, the other inspections don't matter, okay? So I would send this to you as, you know, seller to replace roof, okay? And, and shall not terminate, but in my email explanation to you or in the phone call that I make to you, I would tell you, hey, Savannah, the reason I marked shall not terminate, we, we still have three other inspections we're wanting to do, but we just don't want to pay for it if we can't work things out on the roof. I, I don't think there's going to be issues in any other place, but I just need to protect my client, but we, we've got to resolve an issue with the roof before we can move forward. Okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's it for the form. We, we, we get down here to the body of the language where we talk about now that we have the inspection report, this is what needs to change in order for us to buy the property, okay? And, and I wanna come back here to the one paragraph here. This in, amendment is intended to set forth the agreement of the parties relevant to concerns raised by buyers during the due diligence period. If this amendment does not become effective during the due diligence period, it shall become null and void and no legal force in effect, okay? And I'll point that out so you understand, we can only do an amendment to address concerns during due diligence. Any change to the contract outside of due diligence is done on just an amendment, not an amendment to address concerns, okay? And, and where this is important is a lot of agents think my, my due diligence ends tonight at midnight. So as long as I get this sent, it doesn't matter when it gets signed. No, if this gets signed tomorrow, it's null and void and of no legal force effect, okay? It has to be signed today before due diligence is over, okay? So getting things out before due diligence and fully negotiated is so critically important, okay? Because what I, what I want you to understand, the, the importance of that end of that due diligence period, um, you lose leverage as a buyer if you don't get things worked out during due diligence, okay? And what I mean by that is I've got three things over here that I want to do, I want done, okay? Let's go back to the same scenario. You're the seller, okay? If I come to you and I say, uh, Savannah, if you don't do those three things, I'm gonna take my earnest money and I'm gonna go home, okay? That's, that's, that's leverage, right? Okay, what's not leverage, and this is what happens after due diligence, hey Savannah, I want you to do these three things, and if you won't do them, I'm gonna give you $2,000 and I'm gonna leave. Okay, yeah. okay, you have no leverage. It's you keeping your earnest money is the leverage. After due diligence is over, if, if you can't get agreement and you walk away, you lose the earnest money, okay? So this has to all be wrapped up during due diligence. So now we get to the language. Uh, and, and this becomes really important. So many agents make so many mistakes and probably more mistakes in this form than any other. Um, and I wish I had a report to show you at the same time. So a couple of things that we wanna answer in this space right here. And that's going to be who, what, and when, okay? And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. The question that does not go in here is how or why. In particular, not the why. Okay. Um, so let's say that the hot water heater needs to be replaced. Okay. That may be one of my bullet points. And so I would have down here in this space, okay, seller to hire licensed plumber to replace water heater. Okay, and then I would put 
down here. Uh, all work to be completed no later than five days prior to closing. Okay. So, pretty simple. So would hire a licensed plumber to replace water heater. Is there any doubt what needs to happen? No. Is there any doubt who needs to do it? No. Is there any doubt when it needs to be done? No. Okay. So compare this to what we see on amendments all the time. And they will put something on this agreement that says something along the lines of all parties agree that the water heater is not functioning properly and needs to be replaced. Okay. Great. Okay. I'll agree to that. Yeah. I, the water heater doesn't work and somebody should replace it. But if I'm the seller and I sign that, what have I agreed to do? Nothing. I haven't agreed to do anything. Okay. So you need to have the who is going to do it, and that can either be the seller or it could be a licensed contractor that's doing the work. Um, e either one of those. Um, and you can add things in here, you know, seller can provide receipts. I have no issue with that whatsoever. Uh, but um, the, the couple of things, the, the how and the why, okay? I don't need to know that the inspection report says that this isn't working right, okay? Number one, mentioning an inspection report makes the inspection report part of the contract, okay? And who all has to see the whole contract? The attorney, the lender, and the broker, okay? Out of that group, who do I not want him seeing the inspection report? the lender okay I may be perfectly okay that the roof is in terrible condition because my cousin Benny is a roofer and he's going to do it for me at cost okay but the bank cares that the roof is in terrible shape so I didn't ask for the roof to be repaired but now the inspection report is part of the contract which means the lender is going to review it and they're going to say here's a red flag um, we're not willing to write this loan unless the roof gets replaced. Well, now we just blew up the whole deal because the seller is not willing to pay my cousin Benny to replace the roof and, and everything kind of just goes to, you know, get on a handbasket, okay? So we never want to reference it. That includes don't put page numbers in there, anything like that. As far as this, seller to hire a licensed plumber to replace water heater. Does it matter that I want it replaced because the water heater is 12 years old. No. Does it matter that the water heater that's there is rusty? No. That it was installed correctly? No. None of that matters. All that matters is the seller is to replace it. So just keep in mind as you're filling this document out, we always want to make it as simple as possible. Okay. We want to be really clear with our language. Okay. And, and we need to be specific enough that if at some point we're in a court and we have this document and we've got 12 jurors looking at it that every one of them interpret it to mean exactly the same thing and, and I'll give you an example of what I mean by that um, uh, seller to have contractor replace all damaged siding okay well there's a piece of siding on the side of the house and it's got a little ding in it, okay? Is it damaged? It depends on what you said. So if I lined up 12 jurors, would all of them agree, is this damaged or not? No. But if I were to say, so to have licensed contractors replace three bottom rows of siding on the back side of the house. 
is there any debate what needs to be done? Okay, so that that's the level of specificity that, that you need to have when writing your amendment to address concerns. Okay, now the the next thing is we may not be asking for repairs. Okay, and and so we may be asking that we were we change the sales price. Um, we may be asking we're selling changing seller's contribution to closing, we could be changing the closing date, any number of things. The thing I want you to know about, this is true for amendments in general, the amendment to address concerns being one, is let's say we were under contract for $206,000, and we did our inspection and we found a few repairs, and I've been talking with the other agent, and we've agreed that we're gonna reduce the, the price by $3,000 in lieu of repairs, okay? What a lot of agents will do is they'll get this report and they'll put uh, sales price will be reduced by $3,000 in lieu of repairs, okay? Well, who sees this document? Everybody, yeah, the attorney, yeah. the lender, the broker. Uh, who, do, who do we not wanna see the inspection report? The lender, and if the lender sees sales price should be reduced by three thousand dollars in lieu of repairs, what do you think their first question is going to be? What, what repairs? Yeah. Okay. They want to know what that issue is. We don't need to ever list why. So I already erased it. Why does not matter. Okay. So if I want to reduce the sales price by three thousand dollars, here's what I write in that box down there. Sales price is $203,000 and we're done. It's that simple. Don't overcomplicate it, okay? I don't need to know what the sales price was. I don't need to know how it changed. This language replaces what's on the contract. So when I write sales price is $203,000, that replaces where the contract said 206,000. That is all that's needed. So you've got all of this filled out on your form up here. You've got buyer's due diligence period shall terminate. Sales price is 203,000. We're done. Just get both sides to sign it and we're headed on to the closing date. Okay? And the same thing would be true. Closing date is, what's the closing date? Um, uh, seller's contribution to buyer's closing cost is, put that amount in there. Um, kind of thing. Uh, the only other thing that you may run into that, that you need to be aware of is when did this need to be done? Before? Uh, uh, before um, uh, the, uh, the before the deal closing. Before the deal closing. Before the Before due diligence is over, okay? So I'm buying your house. Okay, so we're under contract. Uh, we just went under contract this past weekend. Um, our due diligence is up on Sunday. Okay, today's Thursday. All right. Um, we just got our inspection report back today, and I found out I do need to get a roofing contractor out there to look at the property. Okay, he's not going to be able to make it out there till Monday. Okay, what do I need to do? If everybody agrees, yes, you can. Okay? Extend the due diligence. Talk to the other party and say, hey, listen, everything looks pretty good, you know, but we do have a potential issue with the roof. We want to get clarity and find out if there's really an issue or not. And if there is, what needs to be done? Um, the earliest I'm able to get my guy out there is on Monday. Can we extend due diligence to Tuesday? Okay? And if due diligence was over on Sunday and we're asking to extend it to Tuesday, do you think you're getting a lot of pushback from the other side? No, because if there's a roofing issue, who's that roofing issue is gonna be a problem for? Every prospective buyer that comes along. So let's get our answers, let's try to move on. We're not trying to terminate the contract, we're not trying to get out of it, we're not asking them yet to replace the roof, okay? We're trying to gather the information and if the agent is good on the other side, they know that
that if they tell you no and you terminate, well, the next buyer is going to have an inspection done and there's still going to be an issue with the roof and they're going to have to go through it at some point. So let's go through it right now. Okay? Good. All right. Q and A time. <laughs> so, I don't know. Does, it, does this help clarify things? I'm gonna look on Facebook real quick. See if we've got any questions over here on Facebook. Uh, the volume is very low. Extend the due diligence. Mika Pearson is watching. Hey, Mika. Uh, all right, guys. No sense. Any questions? I, I know you're super new. And, and don't really know yet what to ask. But um, maybe the uh, the south one that we saw the knock thing. Terminate. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Um, no, and that's perfect. So when when we're during due diligence, so we we got under contract and we've got ten days of due diligence. Okay. We just went under contract on Tuesday. I got my inspector out yesterday. I got my report back today. Hey, there's these four things that we want done. Okay, and I can tell you, you know, hey, if you'll do these four things, I don't need my other six days of due diligence. We're not going to change our mind. Okay. We're not going to ask for anything else to be done. Okay. All right. That's We've good. done all the inspections we need to do. We're through with due diligence if you say yes to this. Okay. Okay, the, the, the converse to that is um, the, the only time I'm going to say shall not is, hey, I want, you, I want you to do this and agree to this, but I may ask for something else in the future, okay, or I may terminate in the future. Well, it, it, that's, a, that's a hard ask. I really need, I feel like, justification yeah. if I put shall not on there, okay? And my, my justification is we need to get agreement on this, but I've still got a couple of other inspections mm -hmm. that we need to get answers to before I can say shall terminate. Okay? I, I still need to get an answer from the pool guy. But the pool guy's not going to be out there for four more days. I'd love for us to go ahead and get this negotiated and, and leave things open. Hopefully the pool guy is going to say everything is thumbs up and good and we don't have to ask for anything else. But just in case there's an issue with the pump system, there's an issue with the liner, mm -hmm. we, we still got an opportunity to negotiate that stuff. Okay. Okay? Yeah. That makes sense. So, perfect. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Man, that was awesome. And I get right at an hour. So, that was perfect. That worked out perfect. It did. So, very good. All right, guys. I hope you found that helpful. Call me, text me, email me. If you got any questions about inspections, amendment to address concerns, and we'll talk to you all soon.